to our post-Cabinet press briefing for this week. Cabinet met yesterday, the third day of March 2014, 2015, and coming out of that Cabinet meeting, Dr. Roger Lundgren, who's the head of the Presidential Secretariat and Secretary to the Cabinet, will bring you highlights from a number of matters Cabinet wishes to bring to the public's attention through you, the media, after which we will entertain questions on his opening statement and I rather suspect today we'll be able to entertain other questions of a topical nature. I'll hand you over to Dr. Roger Lundgren. Thank you, Kwame, and good morning again, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Cabinet met Tuesday, the 3rd of March, 2015, and arising from that Cabinet meeting, these are the matters I will be bringing to yours and the public's attention. Contracts. The anti-money laundering, an update. National insurance scheme, data entry and verification, the extended project activity. The Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry update and dissolution of Parliament. As Kwame indicated, for this session, we plan to address questions and clarifications related to topics in my opening statement and in any in the absence of any particular order questions clarifications on matters of topical interest allow me to start then with contracts contracts for which cabinet granted its no objections for awards. I'd start with the public works, and we're dealing here with the road transportation sector. And this award, the East Bank of Demerara, it is the prioritized intervention construction of reinforced concrete drains from Providence to Prospect. Providence to Prospect on the east bank of Demerara in Region 4. And that award. 2.1 million US, my mathematicians have advised, oh, it's in lots actually, aggregately 2.1 million US, and my mathematicians have calculated at the going exchange rate 400 and 42 odd million Guyana dollars. 442 odd million Guyana dollars for the construction of reinforced concrete drains. The East Bank from Providence to Prospect. Housing and water. An award for the upgrade of roads in Section D of Sophia. Upgrade of roads in Section D of Sophia. This is in Georgetown in Region 4, 
an award of 49.5 million Ghana dollars. 49.5 million Ghana dollars. Continue in housing and water, and we're dealing with the construction here of the heavy duty bridge. This is an access bridge, and it is at Bell West, that's right across, the, right over the river, in that whole Parkway Harmony on the Neiman Housing Estate, and that is at a cost of 85.3 million Ghana dollars, 85.3 million Ghana dollars. The procurement of the high density filing system, the procurement of the high density filing system, this is intended for the deeds registry, intended for the deeds registry, and I suspect to file the mountain, mountains of the property data that is accumulated over the centuries, and that award 87.1, 87.1 million Guyana dollars. High density filing system for the deeds registry. In health, the procurement of one compact laser workstation, one compact laser workstation. This is intended for the Port Moran ophthalmological unit, and it comes at a cost of 17.9 million, 17.9 million Guyana dollars, 17.9 million Guyana dollars. This is the procurement of one compact laser workstation. In health still, the purchase of medical oxygen. The purchase of medical oxygen intended for the health, public health institutions, and this is at a cost of 15.8, 15.8 million Guyana dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, those were the awards. Government granted its no objections. Continue. National Insurance Scheme. The data entry and verification project, and here we're dealing with extended project activity. On the cabinet's guidance, the board of the scheme has approved further project activities by which the in excess of one million unverified contributions would now at last <coughs> be verified and credited to the currently unknown contributors. This is, will be effected by extended project activities, two components, one an in-house component which sees the placement of national insurance scheme staff, experienced staff, to address queries at the local offices where the bulk of the 1.1 million unverified contributions occurred. And the second component, the public awareness component, by which the scheme on the cabinet's guidance will undertake 
a activity that commences on the 1st of April, notwithstanding it being all Fool's Day, but an activity that commences on the 1st of April, providing to the public and particularly into those communities where the unverified contributions arose. That's where the employment took place. Information that would allow prospective contributors who may very well own those contributions to be identified. Specifically, the public awareness would provide to the public the dates, the dates on which these unverified contributions were received by the National Insurance Scheme. It would also identify the employers. So the dates and the employers. The last bit, of course, is the area, the local offices. It is anticipated that armed with that information that would be contributors <clears throat> or would be identified contributors would be able, <clears throat> excuse me, to advance their credentials of ownership of those contributions at the local, the appropriate local offices. So luncheon's contribution record that reveals contribution that are not credited for a particular period which appears on the information logs produced by the scheme identifying those unverified contributions ought to encourage luncheon to make a claim. The expectation is that this process, where based on the information made available, would be identified contributors making claims, that process would extend for about three to four months. It is only after the end of that cutoff point that the decisions would be made who gets what. So in the case where there are multiple claimants, it resolves around the adequacy of the credentials presented. So a four month period for the collection of information and then a cutoff point subsequent to which the contributors would be notified of their, maybe the word success might not be appropriate, but essentially they would be notified that they are eligible or they have been deemed eligible to become the owner of those unverified contributions. As I said, April the 4th for a minimum of four months. This extended national insurance scheme project activity. Anti-money laundering, an update. The Financial Action Task Force February 2015 plenary 
was held in Paris. Notably, Guyana was no longer required to attend, to participate at that plenary. The targeted review of Guyana's performance in achieving CFATF and FATF compliance legit anti-money laundering legislation had given rise to an action plan that had been adopted in the October plenary of the Financial Action Task Force. Under that action plan, Guyana had undertaken a series of measures, interventions, that dealt primarily with the non-legislative aspects, the non-legislative aspects of the compliance requirements of FATF. In its report, to the American Areas Review Grouping, which was overseeing Guyana's performance of that action plan, Guyana was successful in advancing the case for its completion of those actions that were due by February. And on that basis, it was agreed that Guyana would not need to attend the February plenary at which that report would be tendered by our constituency, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. What that means today, post-February, is the next evaluation period for the action plan that arose during or subsequent to the targeted review is May, May 2015. And again, there are specific measures, there are specific measures that Guyana has undertaken to have implemented and completed by that date. So in May of 2015, Guyana's compliance with the terms of the action plan of the targeted review would again come under consideration of our AARG, that's the American grouping that is overviewing, has oversight responsibilities of Guyana's compliance with that action plan, it is me that we would confront the next hurdle in completing the entire targeted review process. As has been established, September, of 2015 is essentially the drop dead date. And this is the date by which Guyana has committed to have enacted FATF compliant anti 
money laundering legislation. It is a commitment that the government, the PPPC administration made to FATF and it would be pursuing vigorously in the 11th Parliament. Commission of Inquiry, Dr. Walter Rodney. Cabinet at its meeting of Tuesday, March the 3rd, 2015, agreed to extend the life of the Dr. Walter Rodney's Commission of Inquiry beyond the Tuesday, March the 31st, 2015, current date, to Friday, July the 31st, 2015. July the 31st, 2015. The proceedings so far, as is commonly available, commonly known, has been illuminated. This is Cabinet's contention, and that has to do with the body of evidence to unveiled so far that points squarely to the role of the then Bornemite PNC government and party in Dr. Rodney's assassination in June of 1980. The witnesses appearing so far before the commission and the public itself have confirmed strongly, strongly held suspicions about the then ruling PNC's role in Dr. Rodney's death. The remaining gaps are so visible that Guyanese must be wondering why in the face of openness of this quasi-judicial inquiry, the proceedings so far have not addressed these glaring gaps. Why have those surviving PNC government and party personalities of that era, why are they not, have not risen to the occasion and volunteered or made to testify as yet? What is preventing them from so doing, from being present and being and, and testifying at the hearings during this inquiry? Mr. Corbyn, Mr. Harmon, Mr. Granger, in particular, have apparently declined participation even in the face of what appears to be testimony of their involvement attested to by previous witnesses. 
the extension to July the 31st, 2015 of the life of the commission still leaves the door open, providing opportunities for the as yet PNC are PNC party and government officials of that era who have survived to come forward voluntarily. The period to July the 31st, it is cabinet's intention to see the end of the hearing and the completion and submission of the final report of the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry. Dissolution of Parliament, as he had earlier declared, President Donald Ramatar proclaimed the dissolution of the 10th Parliament officially on Saturday, February the 28th, 2015. President Ramatar also proclaimed the dissolution of the 10 regional democratic councils on the self-same Saturday, the 28th of February, 2015. Notwithstanding the dissolution of the 10th Parliament and the 10 councils, the holders of the positions of ministers of government, the speaker of the National Assembly, and the chairman, chairperson, sorry, and the vice chairperson of the 10 regional democratic councils would continue in office until the new president is sworn in subsequent to the holding of the general and regional elections on May the 11th, 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the matters arising from our cabinet meeting on the 3rd of March, I wanted to bring to your attention. And as I had indicated earlier, in no particular order, I will be prepared to respond to questions and clarifications on my opening statement and those other matters of interest to the members of the media. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Lunch and Stacey Carmichael, James NCN. Two quick questions. How is Cabinet responding to critics on expenditure of health care for Cabinet members? And the other question would be, with the dissolution of Parliament and the absence of the Appropriation Act, um, how is Cabinet addressing public financing? How is it being treated by Cabinet? I'll take your second question first. <clears throat> because at least public expenditure during this historic period is, of course, regulated by constitutional 
and statutory provisions. Statutory provisions, most specifically those captured in the FMAA. Where constitutional provisions are concerned, I think first we have to recognize that the Constitution itself addresses the continuation of government services. I don't think it is ever envisioned that in a situation such as this, elections, no appropriation bill that indeed government would come to a halt. That may be a feature in some other jurisdiction, but the crafters of the Constitution of Guyana ensured that such a policy, such a possibility could never exist. That provision reappears in the statute, particularly in the FMAA, where it goes on to identify a specific mechanism to ensure that government routine business continues. That provision to which I refer is the ministry, the minister of health being given the constitutional and statutory authority to, Minister of Finance, sorry, to release the budget agencies one twelfth of their expenditure, that is their current and capital expenditure every month of, of the preceding year every month. So if the expenditure of a budget agency in 2014 was $100, the Minister of Finance is empowered to release to that budget agency in these special periods, dissolution of parliament, no appropriation act, one twelfth of that one hundred dollars of expenditure incurred in 2014 every month in 2015 until this situation is repaired, parliament or and or an appropriation act for 2015 comes into place. Uh, this is not new stuff. This has not been subjected to any significant constitutional amendment, it has flowed unerringly since the 1980 Constitution. With regards to your second, your first question on expenditure of cabinet members for their health concerns, there are many ways in which one can view this matter. Why can dispose of the mischief that patently is there, collusion between Kaichor News and Stabrook News in seeking to bring this to the public's attention in a specific way. But I can dispose with that. I'm, I'm sorry. 
please I'm saying allow Dr. Lanchon to speak. Do not interrupt. I, yes. I can indeed attest unquestionably about the involvement of these two newspapers. I can attest to them, and I would defy the reporter and Mr. Glenn Lal to insist that they were not involved. But that is neither here nor there. I think that is one consideration that I would dispose of quickly. I think what is more important is an explanation. What is more important is an explanation. This is what essentially has happened over decades, over decades. It is a condition of service. Maybe unfortunate, it isn't written, but it is a condition of service of cabinet members. It's a condition of service of cabinet members when appointed for the state to take care of their health expenses. Uh, this condition of service is not new, the concept. It is indeed applicable to other public officers. All of our representatives abroad, diplomatic missions, also have this condition of service. The difference, however, is that condition of service and its expenditure of cabinet members is not rules-based. It's not rules-based. In essence, one can comb the laws of Guyana and one would not find, save and except for the president and the former president, sorry, and we all know in the effort by this PPPC administration to convert custom and practice to a rules-based system starting with the president, the kind of reception that that has received. But I can say this, that obviously a rules-based system is a better option than what has prevailed over the decades of not the PPPC administration, the administration of government in Guyana. And these benefits, these conditions, indeed have extended beyond members of cabinet to all and sundry, particularly MPs, particularly members of the opposition. And I can go so far as to defy any of them to fallaciously repeating Basil Williams' contention. He is fortunate, I must say, he has not been afflicted by health considerations that would have seen him indeed accessing this facility. But I defy him to say that he is unaware that this facility has not been extended to legions of parliamentarians families, members of their families, for health, and for other emergency considerations. We have even extended it to benefit members who are not even in parliament and not the holders of constitutional posts. I'm not going to 
engage, like Stabbert News in name calling, or the selective name calling that is being perpetrated. But I would say this, the evidence exists. The evidence exists. And indeed, we can produce from the beginning of the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration every single recipient who has enjoyed access to this facility. And contrary to what is being disseminated out there, there is no selectivity. It is not rules-based. It is an exercise of discretion in extending a condition of service to members of cabinet, which has been extended to include other constitutional post holders. I hope I have waxed adequately on this matter. And my challenge exists. I have the information. I wanted to end up by making one reference. And it disturbs me to have to do this. But I have to confront a statement that I suspect might have been innocently made in error. And this concerns Debbie Baca. The president visited Debbie Baca in hospital on Christmas Day, I think it was, and gave me, the HPS, specific instructions to extend the same support that enjoyed by cabinet members and other constitutional post holders to MP Baca. I, amazingly, nothing came of that. But the speaker offered me in a private meeting held in the presence of the clerk of the National Assembly an explanation why nothing came of that offer and a subsequent offer being made then under the prompting of Mr. Granger, the leader of the opposition, one that is being considered in the context of the office of the president access to public financing in the face of no budget, no appropriation act, and the dissolution of parliament. And if I could take you back to um, spending. The contracts you outlined, you outlined earlier that were approved, the criticism has been that some of these projects are not urgent expenditure for a government service to continue, hence why is government approving these spending? You didn't get in the hospital with heart failure and need oxygen. That's why you probably would be made to feel that it ain't urgent and why you um, are proving that. But I, I don't think the need <clears throat> exists for us to go on the extreme and pick out what is clearly the intent of the constitutional provision to avoid. How could we dare not to provide oxygen because they ain't got the parliament. You think the guy who's lying down in the bed or the school children who need books and exercise books, you think they're gonna adopt and accept a city of contention when as we ain't got parliament, there's no budget, so everything gonna be put on hold? That is what the framers of the constitution clearly sought to avoid when they spoke of the commitment of having routine government services continue in such special periods. I would be the first to admit that we probably could break a lance 
I may very well be of the opinion that a specific expenditure might not be considered routine. But the Constitution provides the Minister of Finance with exercising that discretion. It didn't say you have to hold a referendum to determine whether this category of current or capital expenditure fits the bill of routine government operations and government services. The minister exercises that discretion. The 112 million for the commission's work has been expended. Well, I wouldn't be able to say this, but what I can say is once the light is extended, that provisions will be made to accompany the financial obligations, because as you quite readily will understand, of what purpose would be an extension without financing? So uh, obligatory financing until the 31st of July is intended. Adam Harris, Prime News, sir. Uh, the Rodney Commission, you said, had evidence that pointed directly to Burnham administration, and you named some people. One of the people who testified was a fellow named Jomo Yearwood, Holland Yearwood, a friend of Rodney. Did you take his testimony into consideration when you made that statement, sir? And, uh, came, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 it's all right. That, that was with that one. I was finished with that. Mm. I'm not sure we'll get to ask the second one. No, no, go ahead. Well, We've been encouraging. Question, and then we'll... I, I, I particularly would like to be the second question had to deal with this accusation that Kaichur News was involved in the release of information on the medical bill, and you said you have the evidence, sir. Would you be prepared to provide or release the evidence here? I can say in terms of that second question that Cabinet was informed of the Kaichur News reporter who reached out to a cabinet member. I phoned on this self-same issue, a conversation that was interrupted by Mr. Glenn Lal during the minister's attempt to respond to the Kaicho News reporter. Fast forward, not Kaicho News, that brought this matter to the public attention. Kaicho News started out, as you might recall, Adam, in inveigling against MPs who allegedly were being paid for doing nothing. But Kaicho News didn't follow this one on the cabinet members. I presume a mechanism exists for passing on the baton to Starbuck News. If indeed, coincidentally, parallel lines of investigation, I am willing to withdraw. But on the surface, what was presented to cabinet was unquestionably Kaichor News involvement in this matter and Mr. Glenn Lull's actually participation on that phone call to the cabinet member when this matter was being discussed. It is on that basis this assertion of mine was based. The Jomo Yermud testimony. The Jomo Yermud testimony. I am afraid that the cabinet's contention dealt with the body, as I said, the body of information. Surely there would be what we may, for want of a better word, be some aberrations from this body of information, the body of evidence that would lead us along a different path. But the body of evidence cabinet asserts, the body of evidence cabinet contends 
points unerringly a finger at the then Burnhamite PNC government and the party. Sir Gildari, catch your news. Uh, could you tell us a little about uh, Gaisuko's sale of uh, uh, land to the CHMPA for three billion dollars? Could could you confirm? Secondly, uh, Marriott is expected to uh, be open in the next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, we know there's a court case that's holding up for that. Said for that, where did they sell find the money from to complete the hotel? Okay, I'll answer the second one first. That indeed the financial closure on this Marriott deal has been attended by and delayed by among many other legal interventions. It however has not prevented Marriott from achieving its readiness status for its opening. And that is because the financing necessary to give effect to that launching, to that opening, has been on the basis of understanding among stakeholders advanced by NISIB with the clear understanding that on completion of closure, these funds would be reimbursed. My understanding is a mechanism like that has been put in place. This is my understanding. Your fourth question about the Gaisuko and the sale of lands to CHMPA. There are perhaps many developmental achievements by the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration over its decades in office. But I don't believe any of them can be as touching and as real as the housing drive and its accomplishments. CHNPA has made it clear land is now threatening, well not land, access to land is now threatening this housing drive. The needs are unmet. I can say this without equivocation. The needs are unmet. Every day there are complaints. We have applied and we wait in one-stop shop and notwithstanding, we have accumulated a backlog of no mean order. Land is necessary for a developmental task that is unquestionably benefiting Guyanese of all walks of life. Where is this land going to come from? Where is this land going to come from? The landmass of Guyana is fixed. So obviously, those who have, and particularly in excess of their needs, would have to have a mechanism to give to CHNPA so that they could use that land to respond. It is in that context I would like for you to see the efforts of this PPP civic administration in responding to the demands of the housing drive. 
Guy Suku has the land. Guy Suku has available lands that can indeed be made available to CHNPA for the consideration you mentioned and for CHNPA to use in their discharge of this housing drive and its obligations across the whole of Guyana. Hinterland, all the areas of Guyana, the housing drive, everywhere where Guyanese live. And it is in that context I would want you to see the reach out to Gaisuko to obtain available land for a consideration that CH and PA would now use for meeting its obligations, meeting its responsibilities to house this nation. Yes.